Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to Forum 7, which is entitled um, Challenges for European uh, Governance. That is a very broad uh, topic, so I see that you might be enjoying broad topics, and indeed that is what we will be uh, presenting to you uh, this uh, afternoon. We have discussed the order <coughs> of this uh, forum in the following way. We might uh, start with uh, Mary Futter from Nottingham University, who will uh, address uh, the challenges that Brexit might bring to uh, European uh, governance. Then Deidre Curtin from the European University Institute will follow on that issue, uh, but then f uh, focusing on issues of uh, uh, privacy. Following her, uh, Irene Blasquez Navarro will continue uh, on that line, however, more from a security uh, perspective. I think I have not uh, given uh, too much out of what we will now be mis uh, listening to, so uh, I ask uh, Mary Futter, please, to start our, uh, her presentation. The idea is that we have a first round of about 10 minutes that uh, each speaker gives uh, her opinion uh, and her topic. Then there will be a short round of commenting among the panelists, and then we will open to, uh, to the members, um, to you, to discuss, to ask questions, and to do comments. That is uh, how we thought to organize it. And Mary, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Armin. All of us here in the room have woken from a bad dream. In that second where we suddenly are conscious gains the upper hand and we realize it's not really true and we sigh with relief. Just imagine that you actually wake up and you find out that it really is true. And this is what happened to us in the UK. On Friday the 24th of June, many of us woke, myself included, to shock, disbelief, and above all, anger. Why have I done this? Why have I given you my personal feelings and reflections? Because I think I want to convey what Brexit means. It means a lot of things, but it doesn't mean Brexit, which is what the current mantra is of the UK government. Brexit means Brexit. But you could just as well say breakfast means breakfast the first meal of the day that we all take. What happened in the UK? We went through, believe me, a kind of grieving process. For two weeks, many of us didn't speak to one another about what was happening. I myself couldn't speak for the first 24 hours after this vote came down. Um, nobody quite expected it would happen. But I think it reflects a much broader crisis of governance, and it's a crisis of governance at the national level as well as the European level. Yes, we are a group of collectively, collective group of 28 states, but we are also individual states with individual identities and individual sovereignties. If I look objectively and reflect on the process leading up to that referendum vote on the 23rd of June. Um, I think above all, the thing that marked it out was the process of disinformation. Ayel Benvenisti, in the panel that just preceded this on multilateral governance, also mentioned the point about disinformation. Many people in the UK, and it didn't matter whether you were for Remain or for Leave, were given a lot of information that was incorrect. Many of those voting in the referendum didn't actually know at the end of the day what they voted for. And the matter was not helped when at the last moment Michael Gove, then Minister of Justice, actually said, oh, well, we've had enough of experts. So experts like you and I, academics, anybody who had a view on the economic or social ramifications of what a leave vote would mean. But if, again, I look at the indicators that, and I've looked before and after the referen referendum, the indicators that were in play before the referendum, 
growing inequality. Growing inequality based on discrepancies in wealth and access to basic services, to health, to education. Not unusual, we know that for other parts of Europe as well. After the referendum, what did we see? We saw increased discrimination, name-calling, um, many European nationals who were not British being told to go home, public, on public transport, in the streets, in schools, some children being um, told just go home, we don't want you here. So there's been a very nasty backlash in the country itself. Another factor was the sense that many felt that the forces of globalization had just left them behind. This is the ordinary citizen. And the matter wasn't helped when Nigel Farage of the UKIP party and one of the leaders on leave made the point that this was a victory for the little man. He's now been telling Trump uh, supporters in the United States that they should also be looking out for the little man. Another factor was the fear and the worry that the European states are unable to deal with the growing tide of migration. This is irrespective of the fact that the United Kingdom has taken, it's probably the country that's taken the least number of immigrants of any of the 28 countries, including Syrian um, refugees. That's quite shocking, but it's true. The other worry was about the temporary movement of Europeans from other parts of Europe. We've had net movement of persons from countries, particularly Poland, that have um, moved into rural areas and taken places in schools and uh, in the health service and so on. Um, what has been the response to that? The UK is going to um, reconsider its plans at Calais. It's talking now about building a 13-foot wall to keep out um, immigrants on the French side of the channel. And I could go on. The disadvantages that many British citizens felt, they felt that the some of those that voted leave felt that the European Union had been taking too much from the British public in terms of money. So the Leave campaigners had promised that £350 million a week that we pay into the Brussels coffers would be returned to the UK and put into the National Health Service, which is still free and is still the free public service for everybody from cradle to grave. Actually, um, the, the amount is closer to £250 million a week that we pay because we have a significant rebate that was actually negotiated by Margaret Thatcher at an earlier stage of the Conservative Party domination of the country. We also are, of course, net recipients of a large number of European funds, mostly for education and in the form of grants for local and regional development. Um, but the fact is, um, we have a very serious crisis on our hands. And the thing that is most scary is that no one is really taking proper responsibility for this. We still have, there is no clear roadmap, there is no plan as to what we're going to do, even nearly 90 days after the referendum. If you put it bluntly, it's a dereliction of duty by the UK government. And it's a continuing duty of dereliction as long as it's unclear as to which way this current government will go forward. And in fact, on the day of the referendum result, only the Bank of England and the UK Treasury had any plan at all for dealing with the economy. So we have really serious issues. Um, I could go on and talk about some of the sovereignty issues and territorial um, issues. I think I won't because we're really going to concentrate on governance, but I'd be happy to take um, questions about that. For example, will the, could the Brexit vote, um, the referendum, could it lead not only to the UK leaving the European Union, but also to the break off of the, European, uh, of the United Kingdom itself, which is a possibility. Um, and there are ramifications in that respect as well. Um, I think um, 
probably the best thing for me to do at this point is not to uh, go on for too long. I can't actually say with any certainty as to what might happen or when we might invoke Article 50. Um, that's a moving target at the moment. It's still, if it happens at all, likely to happen probably in the early part of next year. But what I do think the message I would like to convey is this may have very serious repercussions for uh, European governance um, because it's not a one-way street anymore. It's not just a question of the UK leaving the European Union and it's bye-bye and we do our own thing. Um, all of our laws and regulations are, many of them are based on um, European Union law we will have to make very conscious decisions about what we take, what we leave. Um, we will have to have a new relationship with the, Europe, with the other 27 states. We don't know what that's going to look like. It affects our position within the governance situation at the international level as well. So there are many things still to be sorted out. A conservative estimate maintains it could be 10, maybe 15 years before we are fully removed from the European Union. And in all that period, we're going to need new governance structures, we're going to need new thinking, we're going to need a new way of doing things. Um, a crisis like this means change. It also brings new challenges. At the end of the day, this might all simply collapse. We don't know. I did pick up the fact, by the way, that downstairs in the Juris de Vards Hall, where many of the panels are being held, there isn't actually an original of an old treaty. It's on page 31 of your program. And it's called Duke Jacob's Trade and Shipping Agreement with Oliver Cromwell. Because the United Kingdom in an earlier period of its history was a republic for 12 years, and Oliver Cromwell ruled and he actually developed a treaty on free trade and shipping in an earlier period of time. Unfortunately, Duke Jacob was um, captured and imprisoned by the Swedish, that's not mentioned in your program, and <laughs> when he was, the, the treaty dates from um, from 1657, he was held prisoner from 1658 to 1660. When he was released, the um, royalists had prevailed, the monarch had been restored, and the treaty was no longer given any effect. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction to our forum, and now we have Deirdre Curtin with her presentation, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Armin, and um, thank you for the invitation to be here in uh, Riga at this impressive conference. Well, I'm not going to talk on Brexit, um, but nevertheless, what I am going to talk about has something to do with the role that the UK sees for itself and maybe is already developing um, at the moment in the context of security, uh, which I think is, one, is obviously one of the challenges uh, for European governance more generally. Um, and I think it's interesting that the new commissioner designate um, is actually has been given the portfolio, if that all goes through, um, for a security union. It's now the new term is the security union. Um, but this is a topic on which the UK actually opted out of completely all those years. Um, and in a very recent, I was going to start my observations to you by quoting from a recent, and I mean post-Brexit, early July, UK-France joint paper on data and information sharing and they put one of the governance challenges um, in these words. Information and effective information sharing are our first line of defense in a world of increasingly mobile threats. Um, now, I realize this may um, also speak to what you're going to say, but then we will have uh, a conversation on that um, later, and I'm sure we've got perhaps slightly different angles on it. 
Um, the post 9-11 legal landscape has witnessed, as you know, a fundamental reconfiguration of the relationship between the individual and the state in the United States, in the European Union and globally. And one of the challenges is, of course, that data is by its very nature not tied to jurisdiction or traditional legal understandings of territory. At the same time, we have private actors who are part of the legal landscape and operating globally. But we're not quite sure about the nature of the phenomenon. If we just look at Facebook, with its 1.71 billion active monthly users, as one writer put it recently, that isn't a company. It's a territory more populous than any nation state. We barely have a language to describe this realm, let alone a way of conducting politics within and around it. As we know, and this is just by way of background, our data finds its way into the hands of national security and intelligence agencies, not only the American NSA, but European counterparts and, of course, el elsewhere. Now, legal responses in European law in order to address the privacy challenges posed by generalized preemptive surveillance um, has essentially, and to a large extent, been transformed by judges, in particular in Europe, um, in order to counter um, this, what is seen as a, the, the chilling effect of this kind of mass surveillance. Um, and the reason why judges and also data protection commissioner, commissions in Europe are so prominent nowadays is arguably because there is no global regulation governing the internet or otherwise. There is no international agreement on the protection of privacy, although there are recent calls, as you as international lawyers will very well know, for one to be adopted. Privacy advocates recognize the need to plug this loophole, and there's growing support for doing so by means of a multilateral agreement that would establish internationally applicable safeguards. Some are, are skeptical, some international lawyers in particular are skeptical. Be careful what you wish for is the um, title by one uh, international lawyer, Stephen Schulhofer, who argues that such an agreement, far from strengthening global privacy protection, would almost certainly weak, weaken it. And he feels that executives should not be given a free reign behind closed doors to design a system which might be in their own image and interest. Um, so paradoxically, his view is that, um, and this may be an American view, um, that what we need is sort of American exceptionalism and leaving all nations free to go their own way. Now, the view of judges in Europe is clearly different. They don't think anyone should go their own way, at least not when they want to share European data. It seems that the judges in Luxembourg may have the ambition to take the lead not only within Europe, but also more globally. As the now president of the Court of Justice, um, Kuhn Lennertz told the Wall Street Journal already last year, why would Europe not be proud to contribute its demanding standards of respect to fundamental rights to the world in general? And we're seeing this happening. I don't, I'm sure, need to repeat um, that to you, but there are different legal instruments from data retention directives to safe harbor um, to uh, being struck down um, within the European system or, or declared invalid for breach of the European principle of privacy. And only yesterday, in fact, um, Advocate General Mangozzi advised the court to invalidate the EU-Canada PNR agreement for breach of European norms of privacy. Um, so the specifically European expression of data privacy um, is clearly more than a manifestation of ideas of freedom and autonomy. Um, it's motivated in a fundamental way by a concern about the arbitrary exercise of power. A vague feeling of surveillance, as one advocate general put it, means that others acquire dominant power over the individual who suffer a loss of privacy. And the task that the European judges have given themselves is, it seems, to ensure that the exercise of that power is neither arbitrary or disproportionate. But in my view, these cases merely scrape the surface of challenges to privacy within Europe and beyond. And this is really the point that I want to make in my contrib short contribution to you 
um, this afternoon. There's actually much more afoot in European governance where the rule of law is severely and seriously challenged. There is a technical and hidden underworld existing in a patchwork of very detailed and technical provisions. This more hidden layer of governance grows exponentially with every crisis, most recently the security and migration crises. The rise and rise of what can be termed the datification of personal information in interlinked, interoperable databases with information shared across a wide variety of actors, both internal and external, and across fuzzy borders, is in my view an urgent challenge to European governments. This kind of datification constitutes a new kind of information society and also very much exists and is being reinforced gratefully both in terms of scope and in terms of intensity within Europe. Now, I'm not saying that, that the problem doesn't exist more globally or in other jurisdictions, but I am trying to highlight the fact that at the supranational and multi-level system of governments, which is the European one, um, it, is, it is acquiring um, a very new and expansive form, um, both internally and externally. Um, it's a big subject, but one that is not often considered other than in a fragmented fashion by different groups of specialists. And given the time constraints that we've all been asked to respect, I'll just limit my further comments to very briefly to three, if I may. Um, first, and this, is what, and this maybe will speak also to what, what you're going to say, one of the main challenges is clearly in the field of law enforcement and security. Um, there is a veritable tsunami of new measures creating and expanding databases holding personal information that share information to a wide variety of actors in a blurred and fuzzy fashion that crosses over law enforcement and national security or intelligence. A major problem is the fact that security is spread over fundamentally different European legal and political areas and is partly outside of it. Police and judicial cooperation, EU internal security, private sector involvement in um, are compelled, uh, compelled support for, the, for these security measures, as well as the interrelationship with member states' national security. Yet the EU treaty maintains the fiction that national security is not just totally separate from EU law enforcement, EU internal security and EU external security, but the, that the EU has no competence in it. Reading some of the most recent plans, especially after the recent terrorist attacks in Europe, this is clearly not the case. Second, um, interoperability um, of databases. Clearly, its time has very much come. Um, the new, again, the new British commissioner designate uh, for the new security union within the European Union has placed a high priority in line with existing Commission policy on improving the interoperability of all relevant information systems. So that means how they talk to one another, a wide variety of actors who can access them in a way that um, is very difficult uh, to get to grips with. And my final point relates to um, the rule of law challenges, perhaps I'll just put it like that in the interests of time, um, that is represented by information systems such as the Schengen information system, uh, the VIS, the EIS, the Euro Eurodac, they all have um, compelling or not so compelling acronyms. Um, that basically are multi-level secretive networks based on information sharing um, and that are very difficult for um, the particular characteristics of how they're constituted and how they operate makes it almost impossible um, for challenges to be mounted um, by individuals. They will never know much of it is conducted in, in secret. Um, so there is a real urgent, I would say, internal, I think that's the point I'm trying to make, to the European governance structures itself, um, a real rule of law and accountability um, challenge. Um, so to conclude, um, I would simply say that, you know, there has been much attention paid to 
certain court cases which are very important and, and challenges um, and also irritation or controversy from the outside, whether it's by international lawyers or by the US or whatever, as to what this court in Luxembourg is doing or thinks it's doing. Um, and what, uh, so that's an aspect of the debate. But what is largely ignored um, is the manner in which the EU itself, bit by bit and in a fragmented way, and a not very systemically visible manner is constructing an internal and external security complex that relies on ever further um, datification. And I would submit that that challenge is not only one of access to justice, it's also um, at a fundamental level a challenge for the location and substance of our democracy in Europe. Thank you. So, thank you very much, and Thank you very much, Professor von Bogdandi. It's a pleasure and um, an honor for me to be here today in the company of such prestigious colleagues, uh, with a moderator whom I hold in great esteem, and to have the privilege of addressing this learned audience. Uh, I would like the floor to thank the organizers of this annual conference and the ASIL board for inviting me to take part. In my presentation, I will discuss the European model for security governance. And I'm going to use the fight against terrorism, which will continue to be powerfully present on the European agenda, as a benchmark for explaining the security challenges the European Union faces as a political entity with a multidimensional structure of power and as an example of transnational law. So in a way, I will be presenting uh, some arguments that are only complementary to what's been said already in, in this panel. Underlying the European uh, Union project as a security unit are three ongoing tensions. And common to the fight uh, against terrorism and to other fields, such as uh, cyber security, addressing migratory flows, or combating organized crime. They are, and they have already been mentioned, reconciling sovereignty and security, the choice between intergovernmental cooperation and supranational integration, and the security versus rule of law super debate. And, and this is the context for the um, European security governance. The European Union's action in um, combating terrorism has highlighted these tensions. And to illustrate this, we might recall the Paris attacks of the 13th of November 2015, which were described by France as acts of war and led the country to invoke a clause never previously used, the modal system clause of the Treaty of the European Union. I will come back to this point later. Or we might uh, mention how the recent terrorist attacks have prompted the hasty uh, implementation of measures on the use of passenger name, record data, systematic and coordinator, border control, our vision of the uh, concept of terrorist offense. Well, now it has been pointed out that the European Union's counterterrorism policy is reactive, excessive, preemptive, enforcement-led, and as such, overly centered on border control and mass surveillance. And this calls into question its very comp compatibility with the uh, principles of rule of law. More recently, this criticism has been joined uh, by doubts about its very effectiveness. I, I hold a different view, and uh, my counterargument is twofold. Firstly, the European Union, uh, on the basis of its constitutional prerogatives, but also its limits, has developed what I will call a broad-ranging comprehensive model for addressing the terrorist threat, which encompasses the uh, dimensions and resources associated with prevention, protection, pursuit and response, as well as a strategic policy, regulatory and operational approach. Secondly, I believe that the refer legislative measures are necessary. I do not regard them as an overreaction to the uh, growing concern to combat terrorism effectively, though it is of paramount importance to safeguard the principles of necessity, proportionality, and legality, along with the necessary guarantees of accountability and judicial redress. To support my argument on the EU European Union comprehensive in scope and also in guarantees model uh, in the fight against terrorism, I would refer to the three spheres I have just mentioned. One, constitutional, two, strategic, and three, regulatory and operational. And I will end with a few thoughts on the implications of uh, Brexit in this uh, domain. 
Regarding the constitutional uh, factors that uh, condition the union's counterterrorism effort, it should be remembered first and foremost that the European Union member states are primarily responsible for guarantee and security. This is an essential point to bear in mind when assessing the European Union's possibilities and failures in combating terrorism. It is true that the European Union has it itself is also a security a provider, and I agree with Professor Curtin, uh, when already in 2011 said that the European Union is quietly emerging as a significant security actor in its own right. National security uh, is, remains the principal responsibility of member states, but the member states have handed over to the European Union significant competences. The transfer of powers uh, has been disparate, and the result of a process that has failed to bring the internal and external security dimensions into line, owing to member states' varying internal and foreign policy commitments. The European Union has different competences for addressing its side of the th th terrorist threat, and this has been underlined too, and I think it's one of the important lags, lags in European governance. On the one hand, and concerning the uh, area of freedom, security, and justice, even in this, so to say, internal environment, the intensity of the union's powers varies greatly. For example, they are especially strong with, uh, when associated with the union's economic competences and particularly successful in the field of judicial cooperation, but they are quasi non-existent in other areas that are, are sensitive in any security approach. The member states enjoy a wide margin of discretion. Bilateralism is the norm for arrangement owing to the obligation to duly reserve confidential information and the divide between the internal and external dimensions in security is apparent, as the European Court of Justice pointed out in its judgment on, case, on, the, on the sanctions case. On the second hand, and as for common foreign security policy, and particularly with respect to the new competences, the Lisbon Treaty grants the European Union in combating terrorism, it can generally be said that they confirm that foreign defense policy had been by, built outwards, taking third states as points of reference and skirting the protection of legal rights located within the Union's border. I will only mention France invoking of um, the mutual assistance clause that has been taken to be intended to mobilize a specific specific military assistance beyond its border to strengthen or relieve France leadership in the military missions deployed by France or in the international coalition against Daesh. In turn, an underlying motivation may have been the opportunity to stress the need to foster a real common security and defense policy. Third and last, with respect to the constitutional plane, it is also essential to, to, to mention the discourse of fundamental rights and it is sufficient to refer now to the incorporation to EU primary law of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice in the Caria Saga or the data retention judgment that I think it would be uh, further developed by, by my colleague. I will go on to the second main point of my address, the European Union's strategic approach with respect to counterterrorism. The European Union has been throughout in producing documents on a strategic thought and guidance on action to combat terrorism. There can be no doubt that uh, the terrorist attack carried out in Europe since 2015 have triggered the huge of EU-wide remedial strategies. I will merely identify now some of the selling features of these documents. With the respect to the division of responsibility, it, it is emphasized that uh, in preserving national security, the member states will also focus on the security of the Union as a whole. With respect to the legal rights to be protected, European citizens are at the forefront of this strategic security design. With respect to the guidance principles, there is emphasis on resilience and the necessary balance between security and respect for fundamental rights. With respect to the method for addressing jihadist terrorism, we are witnesses the establishment of what we my call a C approach, coherent, consistent, comprehensive, cross-sectorial, which considers how threats and risks are closely interlinked and affect different policies in prevention, anticipation and response, as well as at the local, regional and global levels of action involving society as a whole. 
and this is the reason why European Union action can make a real difference. And with respect to implementation and response measures, there is emphasis on stressing that the European Union will support member states' efforts to increase operational cooperation. And I think you know, in this field, in this particular field, this is a, a key aspect. Although there, there are merits in adopting a security strategy, the real test of whether it adds value to security policy it, uh, is when it comes to implementing it, is when it comes to translating a strategy into law. And this brings me to my third point, the European Union's most recent regulatory and operational counterterrorism initiatives, which have been speeded up, especially following the uh, conclusions of the European Council's health since the attacks of 2015. To support my argument on the Union's broad of scope on action in all areas of combating terrorism, I could stress some of these measures, multiple measures, using the pillars of the European Union counterterrorism strategy of 2005 to classify them under the categories of prevention, pursuit, protection, and response. But I will only stress now, and we can uh, come to this point later, that th these are all measures adopted in accordance with the ordinary legislative or procedure and are subject to judicial scrutiny by the European Court of Justice. Um, I would only mm, say for, for, for the sake of discussion that as for, for person measures are not worth in a controversial development in the regulatory field is the proposal for a directive of the European Parliament and of the Council on Combating Terrorism and replacing the Council Framework decision of 2002. Um, this instrument includes indoctrination and basic training, particularly over the internet, and also establishes the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters. And the thing is, how broad is this definition and whether it's useful for, for enforcement. And I would like to add that from an operational viewpoint, the enhanced cross-border cooperation between relevant counter-terrorist authorities has been supported by a proactive EU central information hub at Europol, the European Counter-Terrorism Center. And I think this is an important step uh, regarding the, the Spanish experience on the field that is quite positive. In some we can agree that the cooperation has far evolved. European, Europe must do more, but I will leave the point for the discussion. With respect to the consequences of Brexit for security and defense, and in particular in combating terrorism, I believe that we must stress the idea that cooperation, not fragmentation, is the key to modern counterterrorism. And I fu fully agree with Professor Fuller on the, the idea the, that this, of course, is a, what we could call a lose-lose uh, situation for, for, for both parties. Regarding the bilateralism which characterizes intelligence sharing and the cooperation that underlies counterterrorism, the United Kingdom is admittedly an intelligence superpower whose practice and, and culture in the field are valuable to the European Union. It is also a party to the UK USA Intelligence Sharing and, and Cooperation Agreement and a member of the Five Eyes Alliance. However, it is no less true that uh, it enjoys a privileged position in this framework because it belongs to the European Union Club. Therefore, withdrawing from the Union will lead uh, to isolation in that it will not uh, influence any longer the direction of the Union's anti terrorist policy. And it will likewise no longer have access to important. Uh, resources, data sets, and um, so on. I will now end, uh, and uh, only with three remarks. If I am on time, if not, I can leave them aside. I end now. <laughs> it's it's uh, only three remarks. Um, first, terrorism, especially the jihadist brand, is, is one of these global challenges that need global responses. But what I want to, to, to bring to this table is that I believe that uh, we are not fully aware of uh, the difficulty of matching the resources available for combating the jihadist threat to its transnational nature. I think there are many different type of measures that have to be deployed. Uh, second, the European Union needs to do more to, to generate supportive confidence among its member states. But um, I think the European Union law has developed as a consequence of the, of the current crisis and, and built a pattern of, of response. And third, the member states are primarily responsible in this shared project. And of course, no challenge can be greater than the, the wish to overcome it. And I will leave it here. Thank you for your nice and kind attention.
think the four of you have left us with quite a dire picture of the situation in Europe now. Mary, could you cheer up a little bit or somehow comment on the other contributions? So would that be enter now our second round of, of comments on the other presentations and then we open up to the floor. Okay. Uh, I Well, I'll try to cheer us up a little bit, but um, I think what is clear to me, um, particularly from Deirdre and uh, Irene's uh, contribution, is that the idea of Brexit is one thing, but we are so much involved in what happens in Europe. Um, intelligence sharing, um, counter-terrorism, data uh, collection, um, and with the UK being very much at the forefront of, um, well, international measures on peace and security as well as at the European level, it's a little bit more than just um, disengaging from the European Union to have our own free trade agreements. I think this has been the most frustrating part about the whole Brexit debate, um, both before and after, the idea that it's only about economic activity, it's only about trade, um, there's nothing else that really matters. In fact, all of our lives are interwoven with everybody in the European Union and have been for the last 40 plus years. And uh, we're now getting challenges, by the way, in the courts um, from individuals and class action type activity claiming that Brexit will lead to a removal of the fundamental right to be part of Europe for the individual, for the citizen. And the um, case that's going to be heard in the uh, autumn will um, go to the, uh, the higher court and then to the Supreme Court. Um, this is a constitutional crisis, actually, for us. Um, so the ordinary citizen is going to be very much affected. And if I listen to um, particularly Deirdre and uh, Irene, I think there's real uh, a lot of work to do. So thank you. Okay, okay I just have a few remarks, but maybe I'll start with you, um, Anna Lee. Um, on the data retention directive, just from the point of view of the court in Luxembourg, in the sense that um, the original challenge to the directive, if I remember correctly, it was by a member state. It was a direct challenge. It was also on the legal basis. So it was argued in a different, um, in a different way. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that... Um, that that was, you know, both in terms of the nature of judicial review at that time and the arguments that were made, it was quite different from the Digital Rights Ireland and Schrems and everything that, that came afterwards. And I think what changed in the meantime, after that first challenge, was the, um, the leaks. Um, the fact that we knew from Edward Snowden or whoever um, about what the, the extent of the generalized mass surveillance that was going on. And I think in that context of asymmetric power, if you like, then courts, and then the European court in particular, was willing to validate a perhaps more expansive interpretation than it would otherwise um, have done. I also think that um, the fact that there were explicit threats, or explicit, but you know they were fairly explicit, um, from national, constitutional, and other higher courts, such as the Austrian uh, court, but also even the Irish High Court, Jared Hogan, etc., um, uh, that that also, in terms of the, the Constitution, if you like, um, meant that the, co the court knew, in a sense, that if it didn't do something, that national courts would, in terms of national implementing um, measures. And I think what, what, um, what changed also, and why we're now seeing all these cases being brought to Luxembourg, is that you have now all these privacy advocates um, who are so active at all the different levels, and they're crossing over. One, you know, they're, na they're active nationally. They're um, getting crowdfunding in order to be able to finance cases. They're looking for which jurisdiction to go to. So, you know, Max Schrems, for example, first tried Austria, then Luxembourg, and then went to Ireland and, and, and got to Luxembourg. Um, so there's quite a lot of strategic thinking. 
let's not forget also by NGOs um, in the UK in particular going to Strasbourg and also cases being brought in the United States. There's also briefs that are being done, you know, for example, by the, by the European privacy a a advocates in the US in the Microsoft case, but also in other, in other cases. So I think that I would say that that is perhaps, um, it's a slightly different context. You know, there has been a constellation of things that have come together. And what I think is interesting as well is that also in terms of European governance as to where it's going, um, for example, the, the Davis case, um, which is before the court at the moment, that's actually a case which David Davis as a, as a MP brought against Theresa May as, uh, what was she, Secretary of, uh, not Secretary of State, but Home Secretary. Home Secretary, right. Um, and that has to do with so the data retention directive was annulled, so it doesn't exist, it hasn't been substituted. So what happens, of course, is various countries have adopted their own data retention uh, legislation, including the UK, but also many, many other countries. And um, what's interesting about this particular case, so it's gone over on um, a re preliminary reference from, I think it was the Court of Appeal, but it may, I think so, um, to Luxembourg. Um, but it's basically about the application of privacy in that context of national legislation. Um, so the issue is also, you know, to what extent does that fall within the scope of EU law, uh, even when there is no data retention uh, directive. And, and the Advocate General um, has gone quite a bit down that road, um, I find, so the, the judgment still has to be given. But, you know, I'm just emphasizing that it's, it's moved out, so it's not, no longer just challenging the European level legislation, but also purely um, national level. Um, and Mary, perhaps on, the, on a few small remarks on the, on the Brexit, just, just three really, on the referendum, I mean, you, there's an awful lot that can be said, and there's, you know, there are many, many factors in it, but you stress disinformation, um, and of course, that's, that is um, definitely the case, but I think, um, I think the fundamental problem is, you know, is the nature of the instrument of a referendum for such an incredibly complicated um, um, subject matter, you know, it, what, yes or no, um, for something like everything that the European Union and European integration over, over 40 years. I saw it in Ireland where we have a lot of experience of um, referendums also on the European Union. Um, and, you know, big, big issues like that can get hijacked by something that is almost peanuts. Um, for example, in Ireland, I think it was at the time the Maastricht, and I'm not saying um, that this is peanuts by any, by any mean, I don't think it is, and it's still a huge problem in Ireland. But, um, you know, a large part of why there was a no first time round um, in Ireland on the Maastricht Treaty had to do with a tiny little protocol um, on abortion, um, which was part of, um, or was it even a protocol? It's so long ago, was it a declaration or something? I think it was actually a declaration, but anyway, um, that was, you know, people zoned in on that, and because that's such a sensitive issue in Ireland, it still is, um, that became, you know, the reasons why. So there was, there was also a lot of disinformation on that, but it also took over the debate, and I think in, in the UK, I think you saw that happening. Just two other brief comments. I, what I tried to say um, on security, is, you know, in terms of the UK leaving or the UK not leaving, I th personally, I think what we'll see is, particularly in the area of security, is the UK not leaving, mm -hmm. no matter what. Um, no matter what we actually formally get in, and that's also because um, the UK is a phenomenally important player, um, if you like, in the context of security in Europe, and the others also won't want to lose them. So I think, you know, at the lower level and in terms of information sharing and how that is all uh, regulated, I personally um, 
see more of the UK not leaving. And I think it's interesting, you know, the two facts I mentioned, the fact that he has been put in charge of um, the security union, or will be the UK commissioner, and also that apparently, even bilaterally, UK and France are coming together and have this whole vision of how the future of security in the EU is going to be. And finally, I would say, you know, I don't know if this is the place to get into the legal complexities of um, Article 50, but also post-Article 50, so you need the exit agreement, but you also need an international agreement in terms of the future relationship, and they're two separate things. Um, but even there, it's not just a matter of straightforward negotiation uh, between the, the, the British negotiators and the EU, because also within the EU constitutional system, we, if you want to put it like that, have our own empire, umpires. So there are additional kind of supranational umpires who will look at that, who are not the negotiators necessarily as such. And that is, to some extent, although the European Parliament will be involved, but the European Parliament can always decide, um, well, not only to veto, um, but also to ask an advisory opinion to the Court of Justice. And that is what has happened now in, in the Canada Agreement, for example. It was through an um, the request for an advisory opinion by the European Parliament that it got to the court. And then we have the court itself. And, you know, frankly, who knows what the court will do. Um, it has done pretty surprising things um, in, in recent years. I think it's, it's fair to say. Um, or in, even not in not so recent years, if you look at the advisory opinions going back quite a long time on the European economic area, which um, the court um, pushed away or uh, you know didn't allow the first time round, and but also more recently in terms of um, the Canada Agreement or the European Convention on, accession to the European Convention on Human Rights, mind you. Um, so you know. I'm just putting that into the mix that there are also other elements that come into that, that come into play. Probably I should leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the second round. Um, only three three comments uh, with a um, general character. I think uh, we've lived in in Europe um, unprecedented crisis, security crisis. And the way security is uh, understood uh, in relation with values and principles will, will determine the near future in, in terms of the progress of the European society and the uh, model of governance of the European Union as a global actor. So I, I think uh, maybe for all these different crises, the refugee crisis, uh, cyber security or terrorism, there is the need to, to, to think uh, whether what is needed is a, a stronger compromise uh, by the member states. So maybe to share more sovereignty in order to define uh, common policies in, in the area because we are talking about um, dealing globally with these global problems but then we act very locally. And then I would say that in all the different uh, domains we an aspect and problems with uh, brought to this table, I think we always um, leave aside and apart the preventive approach. And I think uh, this is what uh, the crisis uh, uh, have shown, that we are not always, uh, we, we are never well, well prepared, but I think we have to take these lessons learned and uh, don't forget them and try to develop different plans of, of actions and in, in, in incorporate them in the, in the regulatory framework. I think we, we really uh, are taking all time these lessons but never them, uh, put them into practice. Let me have the opportunity to uh, have comments or questions from the floor. I think we can have three in the first round. Uh, who volunteers to start? Please. Hello, um, I'm Christian Jeffal from the Humboldt Institute of Internet and Society. Thank you very much for those four very interesting um, and enlightening presentations. My question goes to Professor Curtin, and um, I would like to um, ask about the concept of governance. 
<coughs> sorry, in your presentation, because um, I, I was surprised that you would um, discuss privacy um, specifically related to state measures and um, uh, legal measures, whereas I think, um, um, of course, identification is a concern, but um, a concern that's uh, maybe wider uh, then, and you've mentioned it in your comments as well, maybe wider is um, uh, simply um, uh, to, to look um, at, the, at the state. Um, a programmer once uh, mentioned to me that the most important privacy governance um, decision that um, is uh, taken in relation to me is how I configure the um, privacy settings of my mobile phone, because this, is really, this really changes a lot um, concerning my privacy. So um, I was just um, um, asking myself, listening to you, whether you should um, maybe open up uh, a little bit the notion of, of um, governance, and um, this applies maybe also to the whole panel um, uh, for the concept of security. In the face of securitization, um, I think it's very important that we make clear about what kind of security we speak of. And um, because uh, there is also the data security, there's very different aspects. And if we, I think, adopt um, one concept that is, of course, um, also right and, and uh, correct uh, in its use, but if we adopt it in our academic reflection, um, we should uh, maybe um, give a cautionary note and explain that it's only a part of um, different notions of security that are possible. There are Germans in the room, so you get questions on your concepts that is to be expected. Please, the next gentleman right there. Yes, um, good evening. Daniel Toda from the German University of Administrative Sciences. Um, and I have just a small comment um, that refers mostly to the presentation of um, Irene Velázquez. Um, so if I got you right, um, you're pleading in favor of uh, more action by the European Union and uh, possibly more competences that it should have in this, in this field of security. And um, my very basic remark is that I'm not willing to give this European Commission and this European Union any more competences of powers, particularly in fields like criminal law, if it does not come together with more democratic legitimacy and accountability. The European Commission is showing um, an incredible reluctance to react to uh, civil society expressions, particularly in the field of asylum or the TTIP, where you have massive opposition in civil society and the Commission is just not reacting and that's because they don't feel the democratic pressure that national governments feel. So, I mean, no more competences if there is no more democratic legitimacy and accountability. And this, this is, I guess, a, the eternal topic of European governance. Uh, Christine Cadus, uh, University of Geneva. Um, thank you first uh, to all the speakers uh, for their contribution in, in this panel. And my question in the form of uh, um, comments and question uh, relates to the Brexit. Um, I understand your position and the different statement you did on, on, on the vote uh, in the UK. But uh, how, how do you see the perspectives for the future relationship of the UK with the European Union? Because we read in uh, the newspapers, we heard the uh, different responsible in the UK discussing different models, different responses for this future relationship. So the two main ones which were mentioned um, are of course the EEA agreement, so the multilateral cooperation uh, between the Union and the EFTA states. Would that be a possible solution for the UK to join uh, the EEA? Uh, how do you see this kind of uh, option? The other one is, of course, uh, uh, I would say a bilateral way, uh, co bilateral cooperation between the UK and the Union. 
Um, the Swiss model was mentioned. I don't know what part of the Swiss model was or interests the UK. Maybe uh, there would be a need to define the fields. Uh, the UK wants to keep from the present, the current relationship in the European Union, which one they want, they do not want. So I think these, of course, are uh, important questions. And maybe third, um, do you see any other approach for this future uh, relationship? So what are your perspective on, on this issue? Thank you. It sounds like the one million dollar question. <laughs> start on that? I, well, yeah. I could do, yes, yeah. You know, sometimes in uh, the academic world, and you're talking with a PhD student or another student, and uh, you can't think of a particularly good um, secondary part to a title of, a, of an article, you say, well, this is a relationship to discover. And I think that's how many of... Um, not only the government, but many of us in the UK feel this is so unclear at the moment as to what will the, what the relationship of the UK to the rest of Europe will be. And at the moment, it's at the political level, and um, it's very polemic, and this is problematic in itself. So the, just to come directly to your um, questions, um, could it be an EEA model? Maybe. Um, but that requires us to remain with the single market and also some form of freedom of movement. Um, the Swiss model, the more bespoke bilateral, maybe. Um, there's also been talk about going for something like a Canadian um, model, the sort of CETA model, but then um, the UK feels it would not get uh, good coverage on services, which is a vital part of our economy, very important sector for us. Um, so now the May government is talking, I mean, this is David Davies and uh, Liam Fox, they're talking about having a bespoke model. So it will be something that nobody's ever seen or done before. Um, of course, this is all well and good for the UK to make this point, but it's not up to us alone. Um, so our future relationship with the other 27 members will not be decided completely by ourselves. So it may be that we come with a bespoke model, but the other 27 don't like it. Um, or we, we don't know. It's just very unclear. And then beyond the European dimension, we've got to think of what our trading relationship might be within the World Trade Organization. I mean, there have been talk of very simplistic um, approaches. Oh, let's just rectify, make a rectification of the customs uh, schedules. Um, well, that's not going to work. There's probably going to have to be a modification of the schedules because our schedule at the moment is the European Union schedule. Um, so it's probably going to end up being a renegotiation of our um, membership in the context of the WTO. This is on the multilateral level. Or we simply go for a, a sort of Singapore-type approach where we have zero tariffs. So, I mean, this is beyond the European um, Union relationship, but nevertheless very important. And the reason I raise that is whatever, we, whatever the UK decides, whichever model it chooses, it's also got to think about the multilateral relationship and the other relationship to other regions of the world. Um, and at the moment, it's extremely confusing because, for, to give you a very good example, um, Theresa May goes to China for the G20 meeting and she comes back saying, oh, well, Australia would like a free trade agreement with, her, with us. And then the next thing she's told by the European Union partners is, well, you're not going to negotiate anything on free trade with any other country until you've sorted yourselves out with us. So this is the level of confusion I would like to call it complexity, but I think that's being too kind. The level of confusion that reigns at the moment, I'm afraid. So it's not a very satisfactory answer to your question, but I don't think I can do better. Sorry. Who can I give? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your for your question. And um, basically, you're you're quite right. I need to think further about the notion of governance that I'm using because. In, uh, but this wasn't a paper, this was a 10-minute uh, forum present. There is no underlying paper. I'm working on the second issue more, and there I would um, say that, um, I would conceptualize it 
within uh, network governance and even um, governance by data, interoperable database or something. So that's the road that I'm going down, but you're quite right. Um, the first topic in, in, is, of course, you can't, I mean, it's a vast topic, as you well know, internet governance, and um, which is basically what this is part of that much bigger panorama. And then there are so many different aspects to it. And, he, and, and law is actually only one small part of it and not necessarily the most important one either. There's a host of other things that are really interesting um, going on and, and, and sort of very bl blurry boundaries as well and also new boundaries. But I take your point that I need to think more thoroughly about the notion of governance but, and also of security. That's a fair point. Thank you. Um, Sorry, only, oh, thank you for, for, for the remark. Um, well, I, uh, I fully agree that um, uh, we can only share and give a sovereignty if we have the, the, the proper balance of powers. And um, of course, I, I think I, I, I mentioned uh, in, in my presentation this, this aspect that uh, one of the important aspects is uh, accountability. And uh, yes, I said, I, I think these big problems, uh, we need a common approach. And this common approach comes from, from giving much more competence to institutions, or, but n not only at the very legislative uh, sphere, always uh, we, we, we tend to, to forget the day-to-day -day problems. And uh, I think we have to coordinate uh, all the different uh, multiple uh, actors, even civil society, with really they play a very important role in, in, in security. So I think we have to, to coordinate much better, and I, I think we have to, to, to develop a much more comprehensive uh, policy with the uh, democratic uh, guarantees and of accountability, um, of course. And, and it's maybe difficult in these times, and um, you, you mentioned the, the, the humanitarian crisis, uh, and I think in this particular field, uh, an important and strong common policy will uh, will have uh, helped to to deal with the, the issue much more better. Thank you for the comment. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of uh, this forum. I see that the picture remains really very dire and dark. Perhaps the upside is that the Drinks, if they are strong, taste much better when the uh, picture is dire. And the drinks will be at train at uh, 8 o'clock. Free, the drinks sponsored by Oxford University Press. At least that publishing house is going very well, so I expect that the drinks are excellent. And um, with this dire picture, I think we will be enjoying them very much. Thank you so much for your uh, contributions, for your questions and comments, and I close this session.